with a Hi everybody, thanks for coming. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director here at the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory. I'd like to thank our indigenous and Métis brothers and sisters for sharing this land with us. And before I introduce Devin, uh, I'd like to uh, bring Susan Schantz, Professor Susan Schantz, who's head of the sculpture department here, to talk about the uh, Michael Messanchuk Travel Award in our history. Yeah, I just want to do a, a little quick PR for the award. So this is a really great award, Michael, in memory of Michael Messanchuk, who was an art history grad in the department. And, uh, passed away shortly after graduating, and his family established this award in his memory. And the, um, these posters will be around the department. There's an award deadline of January 31st every year. The amount of money has gone up a little bit. I think it's 3,000 this year. So you, the requirement is you have to have completed 12 credit units in art history. That includes 120, 121, which everybody should have by the end of their first year, right? And you just need six more. So it's not that hard to get those 12. 85% um, average to qualify for the award, and then a statement about what, what travel you want to do. It's to support students visiting galleries, cities where they can see art. It's really a great opportunity, and I think the family recognizes that because of the value that had for Michael. So um, just watch for these posters, keep the deadline in mind. Bridget, who's in the admin office, is over here, and she I work with her on the department awards committee rep. And Bridget helps in the office keeping track of the various awards. This one is probably on our website too with the awards. Yeah. So you can find um, all our departmental awards on there as well. So it's for undergrad students. So those of you who are graduates, unfortunately, can't partake. But if you're an undergrad, think about applying this year. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce uh, Devin Hanoski here. And Devin was in a class that I taught uh, last year, and I know him to be a brilliant and creative uh, student. He's actually, he's a very interdisciplinary student. He says he's a self-proclaimed flaneur, a documenter, sometimes maker of things. So, of course, he's reluctant and, uh, uh, to, take him, uh, to take on the mantle of artist, but he is, he, do, he admits to making things sometimes. Uh, he, uh, he, but he does all kinds of things, and he's one of, you know, uh, this university's uh, 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 model students in the sense that he is truly cross-disciplinary and he's enrolled in an interdisciplinary degree right now. Um, so he uh, writes academic papers, he researches, in fact he's going to tell us about some of the research that he did on the uh, Michael Lysanchuk Travel Award here. Um, and he can often be seen uh, holding forth in cafes and arcades of our fair city. Um, he does hold a, a BA in regional and urban planning. Uh, last year he completed a BA in art history, uh, where his interests lie broadly, he says, in the details of visual, material, cultural space, uh, ranging uh, from, but not limited to, historic graffiti, and that's, I think, what his talk is going to be about here. Signage, architecture, um, uh, documentary photographer, photography, folk and outsider art, which graffiti sort of, you know, is within the realm of, right? And so, uh, without further ado, Devin Hanoski. Thank you for coming. I'd like to thank uh, Marcus, of course, for setting up the gallery for this lecture. Uh, my partner Ariel for joining me in my travels uh, and being patient with me during them. And most importantly, the family and friends of the late uh, Michael S. Misanchuk, whose generosity is the reason we're all here today. I'm truly grateful. <clears throat> With the assistance provided by this award, I chose to travel to the States for roughly three weeks this past July in search of what are known as monikers, a tradition in which hobos and tramps smart, and in some ways continue to do so, their names as a form of intercultural communication, covering a sliver of North Dakota, Montana, Northern Idaho, Washington State, Oregon, in California, and what would result in approximately 10,000 kilometers following the rails to mixed results. Hi. Nothing to do with that one. Although I found nothing in this particular bridge, 
Uh, my trip was especially rewarding, and if I were to share all the photos I had accumulated, uh, we would be here for some time. That being said, I have curated my photos to discuss some of the more prominent Monica writers and uh, accompanied, them, accompanied them with stories, news clippings, and some personal anecdotes. And I hope you all enjoy. As uh, many of you are likely aware, graffiti is certainly not a modern phenomenon. If you include indigenous pictographs and petroglyphs into the mix, even less so. Evidence of graffiti as a tool for communication, whether utilitarian or artistic, has been documented in nearly every corner of the war world, from messages scribed into the walls of Pompeii, the widely adopted wartime Kilroy was here, to the surprisingly modern tagging of Austro-Hungarian civil servant Joseph Kisilak, pictured here in this illustration, who marked his name across the empire during the early 19th century for the sole purpose of recognition. Today it is nearly impossible to travel any great distance and not see illegible markings, um, done in aerosol, in the exterior of buildings, uh, humorous approved poems in the washroom stalls, or initial scratch in the seat of a park bench. Monikers, however, are a form created by hobos and tramps, sometimes start, starting sometime shortly after the American Civil War, when the then widely expansive railroad was eyed as an efficient and free source of travel to return home to. The free ride that the railroad offered did not go away, but peaked during economic declines as it offered free travel to migratory workers looking for employment. There were so many riding the rails that some estimates, which are not an easy estimate to make given the transient nature of those involved, uh, note up to two million individuals during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Mostly men, but some women and children took to hobo them. Aside from hobos, who were typically the unemployed looking for work, tramps also used the rails as an avenue for freedom and exploration. In the story of the American Railroads by Stuart Holbrook, Holbrook wrote, in 1921, 20,643 undesirable American Railroad or undesirable persons were removed during the one month of October from the trains of property of one company, Southern Pacific. So both hobos and tramps found that through graffiti and the railroad as well, they could both remain in communication as they moved, but also that moving about North America offered a platform to become famous. <coughs> According to Eric Partridge's 1931 book, American Tramp and Underworld Slang, words and phrases used by hobos, tramps, migratory workers, and those on the fringes of society, the term moniker, or in its various uh, iterations, uh, comes from Old English Thieves Cant. Thieves Cant, also known as Peddler's French, was a secret language which was formerly used by thieves, beggars, and hustlers of various kinds in Great Britain and to a lesser extent in other English-speaking countries. Partridge continues that a moniker is a nickname, occasionally a signature or a prearranged sign marked on a wall or building as a guide. The nicknames referred to are common, in fact, almost invariably used in tramp and underworld circles, formed of the person's proper name and a characteristic, or that of that characteristic in the name of the town or city from which they came, such as Blinky Smith, Dopey Benny, Chicago Red, Oklahoma Slim, etc. They are, in short, often a compact biography of the individual. In this diagram from Leon Ray Livingston's 1911 book, Hobo Campfire Tales, Livingston, who I'll get into uh, greater detail momentarily, shows an example of his own moniker, typically including the date as well as an arrow indicating the direction in which they are traveling. Uh, acclaimed author Jack London, who used both the moniker Sailor Jack as well as Frisco Jack in his hobo days, in his 1907 book The Road, recalls seeing the Monica of Skysail Jack in Montreal carved with the jackknife. An Oakland, California native, Skysail Jack carved a perfectly executed Skysail yard of a ship, the name Skysail Jack, and BW91594 placed above conveying the hobo pass through Montreal bound west on October 15th, 1894. London, for whatever reason, chased Skysail Jack clear across Canada over 3,000 miles of railroad from Montreal, following his dated monikers the entire way, to Vancouver only for Skysail to catch a ship into the Pacific Ocean before London could meet him. In Jim Tully's 1924, Beggars of Life, a hobo autobiography, Tully speaks of hobos passing time with this quote. Another amused himself by cutting his moniker on the windowsill. When he had finished, he stood back and admired it like an artist. An arrow was cut through the letters of his name, pointed west and denoted the direction in which he was traveling. The month and year of the trip were cut beneath the name. These monikers are cut, written, or painted on water tanks and other places where hobos gathered. They form a crude directory for other tramps who might be interested in the itinerary of their comrades. Once in a while, a tramp sees such a moniker of a friend and starts in the direction of the owner. This illustration is uh, from another one of A Number One's books depicting the tramp seldom seen who was a well-to-do lawyer, Gone Tramp, known for carving his moniker across the full length of Pullman passenger cars, marking his name on a fence in that same manner here. Which brings me back to Leon Ray Livingston, AKA A number one, 
Livingston was perhaps the first to become more widely known for his markings in the railroad. This is due in part to the several books Livingston published of his exploits, including the moniker practice, as well as his knack for travel and willingness to let everyone know the night of the open road or king of tramps was in town, often approaching the local newspaper upon his arrival. An acquaintance of Jack London and Livingston published a memoir of their travels together following London's death, titled From Coast to Coast with Jack London. Pictured here are two monikers by A number one under a bridge at the Arroyo Seco confluence of the LA River for my trip. The one on the right in white dated August 13, 1914. These were originally found by picture college anthropologist Susan Phillips, pictured on the left, who I met in Los Angeles and spent some time exploring with. The markings are alongside others, including Oakland Red on the right and Tucson Kid, pictured here. It's kind of hard to make out, but that little scroll in the middle is the one. It is difficult to say whether these are true A number one monikers, with names often being borrowed, and it is said there were many imitators, likely of someone as well known as Livingston. These markings are actually just above where the, the vertical wall meets the curve of the bridge, the depth of the river having been dug out at some point, helping preserve the monikers uh, from modern graffiti. Almost 10 hours north of Los Angeles in the Shasta Trini Trinity Mountains of Northern California is the town of Weed, where a water tank remains adorned with hundreds of monikers or tags from hobos, railroad workers, and modern graffiti writers. Given the amount on the tank, I will just share some of my favorites. Pictured here is Floyd M., April 1956, and Mick Setterholm, that may be 1905, 1915, or any number of years. Uh, next is JWS from Seattle. Here is another Floyd, or perhaps the same one, as well as C.A. Pete on June 20th, 1946, done by poking individual nail holes. E.W.K., or perhaps E.K. heading west. Woody S., August 10th, 1931. Each Minch was there on July 13th, 1933. And yet again, another A number one. Influenced by A number one is perhaps the most uh, prolific moniker writer of all tramps, Jesse Wells, AKA Tex, which is short for the extraordinary King of Tramps. Pictured here is an abbreviated moniker in Kashmir, Washington. And on the, the right, Tex himself after being released from the Billings, Montana County Jail in 1931. Tex would mark his name larger and more often than any other, so much in fact that according to Tex himself, he had marked his moniker in over 7,300 cities, towns, and stations in the 15 years prior to 1931, according to the same interview that previous image of text came from. His marking style is rather unique to himself, at times impeccably done using paint, ink, and sometimes shoe polish, or carved with one of the half dozen pocket knives he reportedly carried for that purpose. Text claims he claimed he would do his monikers about 2 o'clock in the morning when the station and yards were most deserted. This 1941 moniker outside of Cheney, Washington, is an incredible example of the effort he put in and the skill involved. <clears throat> this one here is from July 24th, 1929, done in Mile City, Montana, and it's about 15 feet up the wall, indicating text is out to last. It wasn't the only one that appeared evidently placed for either maximum visibility or in hopes it would remain untouched. This here was the first one I found in Medora, North Dakota, and it truly set the tone for the trip. Something, seeing something so hidden and historical you found simply on a hunch was truly thrilling. On the opposite end of town, I also found this one, which I attempted to dig out in hopes of uncovering the date, but I ultimately chose not to expose or scratch the paint with my makeshift, makeshift shovel. <coughs> Sorry. This one, dated 1931 and northbound, is in Oakland, Oregon, on the underside of a railroad overpass. In the news clipping on the right, which is written after his arrest for this exact moniker, is 8,013th, according to the article. Text states he practices various type styles and prides himself on being a real artist when it comes to putting up his adopted title with red or black paint, and continues to say that railroad bulls, which are railroad police, have no artistic sense. I would have to agree. <laughs> uh, this one here is outside of Shelby, Montana. It's another near Cheney, Washington, which railroad workers have been so generous over the years to paint over only the graffiti surrounding the moniker. The carving on the left is on a depot in Tonino, Washington, and the carving on the right uh, in Spokane Valley, Washington, barely peeking out of a sign for the fruit stand that now occupies the historic depot. This one from 1951 near Salilo, Washington, is almost completely brushed away from a uh, wind plant as well as being sun-washed. 
Here is a Texian and France puzzle in the large Spokane Valley art. <coughs> Part of the enjoyment of seeing these in person are the locations as well. This is one that stood out to me and is especially beautiful. Along the Columbia River Gorge, this duotone moniker from 1939 is tucked way up in the rocks of this overpass. As most days were exceptionally hot, I would often come in contact with deer or pheasants hunting or finding shade underneath the bridges. This is a rare text carving on a telephone pole adjacent to a yard in northwest Portland. This one is from Laurel, Montana, of which I must share a poem from text dated 1931 that accompanies this moniker nicely. Poetry, like moniker writing, is another way to pass the time when a tramp is waiting for the next freight or in a jail cell. So the poem goes like this. I went to the depot to carve my name. Agent saw me, but I finished just the same. <clears throat> the same. He got excited, got mad as hell. Into a fight we got, into the ground we fell. We rolled and rolled, a rough and tumble fight. A tramp and ticket agent late that night. After the fight, I made my getaway. Aboard a CB and Q train late that day. I was riding the blinds and headed north. Between the coaches of the cars, we were sailing forth. Laurel was my destination. Between the coaches and privation, the train reached Laurel and off I got. Along came two bulls, says one, Tex, you're caught. So it looks like Tex made it back to Laurel and left the town with his moniker just 20 years later. I too had an encounter with the bull at the Laurel Yard, with hence the poor photos, although I left unscathed. Here's a 1932 Tex, both fading and remaining relatively uncovered by newer graffiti in Maupin, Washington. <coughs> Another example of uh, Tex going high on a warehouse with his 1930 moniker in Bozeman, Montana. Part of me thinks that his ability to go high in these spots was due to warehouse pallets or other materials he could stack over the wall. <coughs> this one took me about six loops of turnarounds, missing the right exit and struggling to find access to the underside of this bridge just outside of Butte, Montana. But I'm lucky I did since it had a Tex moniker from 1958. The following two monikers are on an old warehouse, old wool warehouse in Big Timber, Montana. It's hard to tell from this photo, and I can't show them all, but the entirety of the loading dock wall is covered in graffiti from wool clerks from 1930s until about the 1960s. There must be 100 plus signatures and characters. Here I am doing my best tourist pose with one of the westbound text monikers from 1929 from the same wall. This here is a really great spot, and as far as I can say, is the Tex Mecca. It's in Chehalis, Washington, and both the half buried one on the left from 1960 and the right from 1957 are under the same bridge. Devin, do you mind if I ask, are, are they stenciling, or like, how come they're so consistent with material? Uh, Tex King of Tramps, uh, he would mark the, you know, like he studied letters. He essentially became a sign painter in some ways, so none of them were stenciled at all. So he painted with the brush? Yeah, or shoe polish. Uh, this one is also under the bridge from 1959. You can almost tell the weather may not have been that nice. We texted to write his moniker regardless. Again, this one from 1955, which is weathered quite considerably, is also under the same bridge. I learned that the depot in Chehalis, which I was unable to gain access to due to it being closed, uh, also contains three text carvings in the washroom. So that's at least seven text KT monikers in one town. Even Kilroy was there. The bridge is a real treasure of North American graffiti history. <coughs> this is one of my favorites uh, just outside of Athol, Idaho. This one is likely done in shoe polish. Here's a soot stained text from 1951 that has also survived in the middle of Portland. We had to announce ourselves to the current residents who typically had makeshift locks keeping people out of what was originally intended to keep the homeless out, the old switcheroo. There's another text moniker in Portland that could be seen from the end of a large homeless camp that was gated off and locked. My new friend, a local who is in this picture, talked to a resident who had locked the bridge earlier in the day and had agreed to pay him to allow us in to take photos of the moniker, but unfortunately, when we returned later, no one was home. It's hard to make out in this photo, so I blew it out because I was too slow to catch it. But we even saw a real hobo, <clears throat> or at least someone catching a short ride out of the Union Pacific Yard in downtown Portland in an open box car was both a guitar and a bicycle. How cliche. <laughs> Here's another text outside of Terry, Montana. You may notice the numbers following an X, also present in other monikers by him. I've yet to figure it out what these mean, but they're interesting nonetheless. 
Another fate attack in northern Idaho headed west in 1951. <clears throat> 51. Uh, Texas dad was French Canadian, and Texas also mentioned being in Canada as well. So every time I got close to the Canadian border, I crossed my fingers for evidence of Tex heading northbound that unfortunately did not see. <clears throat> it is truly remarkable both Tex's ability to nudge herself into the American psyche and folklore while at the same time slowly fading away from it. American author and CBS news journalist Eric Savaride, who briefly rode the rails during the Great Depression, spoke of Tex KT in his autobiography, Not So Well the Dream. There were strange men among them, he said. Remarkable men, unknown to the rest of America. <clears throat> no one has written the biography of Tex Game Trance, for example. I never saw him, but I knew there was an obsession in him, not unlike Hitler's, the terrible straining of the ego to find expression. Either that or he was a wandering imbecile having a glorious time. At least 50 times in the course of a couple thousand miles, I came across his insignia, his coat of arms, Tex KT. You would find it carved on the wooden seat of a privy on the edge of a Nevada town, penciled on the wall of a shower room in the Salvation Army flop house in Idaho, Chalked in the iron side of a locomotive tender in South Dakota, painted in six foot high letters of red on a white cliffside high up in the Montana Canyon. Men told me you found it from Maine to California, everywhere, printed, written, carved thousand times in the course of what must have been 15 or 20 years of wandering. Jackson Pollock, who also took to free travel for a brief period, also wrote of text in his memoirs, and Severi, who was albeit modest in his estimations of 15 to 20 years of wandering. This text, KT, on the back of a warehouse in Portland, <clears throat> Although hard to see in this image is from 1970, at which age Tex would have been 69 years old, some 55 years after he caught a freighter out of the Panama Canal and began wandering, far from Severide's estimation. So I will end with some advice that Leon Ray Livingston, or A number one, has for you. Do not jump on moving trains or streetcars, even if only to ride to the next street crossing, because this might arouse the wanderlust. Besides endangering needlessly your life and limbs. Thank you. Um. Anyone have any questions? I'm wondering who Tex was, and like why he decided to get into this lifestyle. And, and from what you, your, your talk suggests that some of these people became hobos for less than practical life circumstances, right? Not that they just had to. I mean, my impression of hobos was always that, you know, there was the Great Depression, et cetera. People lost their money and they were hopping trains to you know, for very practical reasons. But mm -hmm. it seems that some of these people sort of made a decision to live this lifestyle. Yeah, definitely. Like, I, Tex is one example. Like, the names are interchangeable, but the hobo is typically your migratory workers who would travel use, using the rails to find jobs, essentially. So that's why we know them through the Great Depression, essentially. But tramps are, by definition, just wanderers. They're just Travelers who are using the railroad as a free tool to travel across, whether whether it's the United States, Canada. There's also rubber tramps, which are essentially hitchhikers, and many of these tramps were known to uh, hop freighters. And Tex, I know, has been to Cuba, Panama, multiple countries. So uh, my my curiosity is, I'm wondering if they've created these monikers and these other like, internationally, and whether or not they influenced perhaps. You know, railroad workers or other people would say in Cuba to do the same. And I'm unaware of that at this moment. How did you get into looking for these monikers? Uh, at first, when I heard graffiti, I just assumed this would be like traditional artistic graffiti. Mm -hmm. So, what led you down this? Uh, honestly, what led me down this hole was the graffiti you were thinking of. And just being around railroads and history, I eventually sort of was, I heard about. There's a, a recent, a more recent uh, art form of graffiti called monikers as well, by the same name, that's on railroad cars and typically done in like a chalk style oil stick. Um, and those are done typically by railroad workers and sometimes hobos and now modern graffiti writers. <coughs> so looking into the history of that, I found out that there was a deeper history that was even like less told. So uh, I started Googling things, became aware that some of these still exist, and that's kind of why I wanted to get out there and actually document them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <coughs> I'm wondering how you found all your sites. Like, did you have an itinerary when you yeah. left, or did you discover some along the way? I did. I had a, a big map of 
for sure's, possibles, um, different locations pinned that either I was aware that there was some there from uh, other people who I've been in contact with. Um, so not so much websites where you can find all these locations? No, there's no like specific one place that where it would be like a list. Um, but lots of them were uh, also just sort of hunches. Like an, a, you know, an old highway that is not being used anymore, that the bridge is still existing, that has an overpass over a railroad that's near a town, or like the ones that I would want to check out. So you found some new ones? Probably. Yeah. Is it true there's like a secret sort of language these hobos also employed amongst each other to like uh, let yeah. The next one know yeah. about how hospitable yeah. a certain household yeah. might be. Whatever. So that's it's debatable. Is it okay? Because I know um, there's some articles. Both like A number one in one of his books has a, a page of these symbols, mm -hmm. and then I've read other accounts where they get outdated so quickly that they are not used. And then also, this is coming from a community that is built around lore, embellishment, and basically half truths. Mm -hmm. So. It's hard to say whether or not they're actually used or how widely spread. I'm just wondering, like, how, if he's doing paint, uh, some of these uh, traps are using paint, like, do they carry around, like, buckets of paint and brushes, or? Well, Tex is the one who primarily used paint in that fashion, where he had lots, and he apparently would acquire paint I'm sure he stole as well. So, like, but rack, <laughs> yeah, like, does he rack? <laughs> yeah, like well, through Panhead, he would, like, get money and then buy paint. But I'm sure that was also probably half truth. <laughs> and what other media did they use, then, if not paint? Uh, carving, uh, pencil. I found quite a few just pencils up on the bricks of depots. <clears throat> um, shoe polish is one that, um, as far as I know, only Tex used. Um, more recently, like say the 70s, um, probably influenced by that later moniker culture I was talking about, uh, these oil sticks. And would you say this phenomenon still exists? Because you said it's railway workers now doing the monikers. Are there still people? It exists in a, in a different way. It's like evolved. The way the early monikers like this <coughs> evolved from carvings on water tanks to text painting large-scale, very clean uh, monikers. Um, now, people are using various tools to mark their names in like various, um, I wouldn't say about jungles, but just abandoned places along the rail lines. Like, there's still communities who travel, both out of necessity and both out of just pure enjoyment. It's, um, it's kind of a, a punk community that is known, particularly in the States and certain cities like Portland as well, uh, New Orleans, that travel just on the rails, just as, that's just their lifestyle. It's the vagabonds, I guess. So that seems more directly related, but how do you relate this, this history with, you know, more contemporary graffiti art? And festivals, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, clearly they had a sense of their own, like making some kind of history, right? And they had chroniclers there mm -hmm. as well, talking about them, and there was a romance to this, right? Uh, so th what's the relation, do you think, between that and contemporary graffiti? Well, there's a lot of relations to early monikers and contemporary graffiti, having a pseudonym, for one. Um, even just the use of arrows is a common thing. Um, just travel. Instead, of, like, hobos and tramps would use, uh, like, write their names on stationary objects and travel around. The New York graffiti explosion that came out of, uh, or explosion of graffiti that came out of New York and Philadelphia in the 60s and 70s did the opposite, where they found out that trams could be used by them staying there and the trains will move around. So, in many ways, like, the tramps who essentially, like, text is one in uh, A number one. They're doing it for recognition the same way that modern graffiti writers um, So, like, I, I don't know anything about American tramps. I think this has been really cool, but, like, I, I do know bits about Australian and European tramp mm -hmm. cultures, and that's so tied up with ecology and that sense that the urban space is being too small. 
-hmm. And so people are embracing a tramp lifestyle to go out into a landscape that's like a, a frontier and that, that sense of like space. But what really stands out here is that with American tramp culture, it seems to be about the shrinking and urbanization in America, like how quickly you could move around. Mm -hmm. And you'd see these tags repeatedly. I just wondered, like, do you have any sense of what these tramps felt like their relationship was with America in that way? This doesn't seem like an ecological thing, but they're really beautiful environments sometimes as well. They're, like their environment, or their relationship with America. And just like, like their attitude to, to towards it. Well, many were union workers, members of the IWW, and social, had socialist leanings. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of them sort of pushed against capitalist society that was there. Yeah, yeah. So that's a big part of it. That's really um, cool. And I think the multiple uh, depressions sort of entrenched that in them, that it's not working for them, they're going to live their own society, essentially. Do you think this is an international phenomenon? You can find this in anywhere where there are railroads, Europe, Japan, India, wherever? That's the thing, is I've never actually heard of this phenomenon happening in any other country other than uh, Canada as well, um, but I'm curious because Cuba has a ex very old railroad system that many of these tramps have gone to by tramping on like ocean freighters. So I'm curious myself whether or not it does exist to some extent or maybe died off really quickly, but it's quite possible, but nothing that I've ever heard of. It's not documented. No. Hmm. I'm curious about the preservation of, of a lot of these did you come across anything like uh, historical societies that are actually like, preserving yeah. this? Or is this just uh, by chance, like some of them you can see like everything else is like painted over but not that? That is by chance. It's probably railroad workers who just appreciate it. Or like, maybe, maybe they've heard of texting and tramps passed down to their dad who works the railroad or something. Who knows? I know um, I've seen a few examples of that. One where there would be a texting and tramps underneath the bridge and other graffiti. And then, so the railroad company would paint over all of it, and then someone had taken the paint there and like revealed the text game tramps. So there were some people who were aware why it's very, there's very few doing that, and why they've selected those exact ones. Really but strange, just informally. Sure. Right? Yeah, informally. And then there's also like small scale railroad museums. I've found a few scattered throughout the states that have. Uh, one actually rebuilt a shed inside of their museum that was full of monikers. Others have, uh, say, a depot or a railroad shed with monikers have been torn down. They would like keep a single board with the moniker and have a display. That's the extent of it. But other preservation of that, the only other preservation happening is just documentation. You can't really save a large overpass. You know what I mean? It's kind of difficult. But Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's archaeological methods too, to uh, like image censoring type things that could help as far as like uncovering some of them weathered and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. If there are no more questions or comments, uh, thank you very much, thank Devin. You. Thank you. There's, there, there are a few refreshments on the table here. We don't usually have them, but please uh, help yourself. And I'm sure Devin is interested in taking more questions and comments. Yeah. 